Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Professor Miles Prince. I'm a haematologist uh, at Epworth uh, and also at um, Peter McCallum Cancer Centre here in Melbourne. I'm also um, a founder and uh, a board member of the Snowdome Foundation. And the Snowdome Foundation have had a lot of uh, interest and requests to find out more about um, uh, more about um, uh, the issues re relating to coronavirus. So what I'm going to chat to you about in the next 10 minutes or so is the issues uh, around this condition that relates specifically to patients with blood cancers and their carers. So I think most importantly, and what I try to make clear to um, my patients, is that there is really two aspects of how the coronavirus, COVID-19, is impacts on the people in general. The first is that there is a public health issue, and the second is that there's the individual issue. So from a public health issue, it's really important that the spread of this virus is controlled and slow. What that means is that if people do get sick, and it is only a small proportion of people who get sick, then that is spread out over a period of months. And you've probably heard that the term flatten the curve, which means rather than have a rapid peak, which is what occurred in Italy, it mo we, we have a much smaller flattened uh, spread of the virus over months. And that means that if people do get sick, there's going to be the availability of hospital beds and in particular the need for intensive care beds. And this was a problem in, in Italy because uh, patients, there wasn't enough beds and, and patients were, weren't able to get into hospital. And so the last thing we want to see here in Australia or anywhere in the world is where patients are not being able to be looked after optimally. So the public health issue is that we're facing is about controlling spread now. So this is why there's been such an intense program around limiting the spread. And so that's a public health issue to stop the spread and move slowly. How does that implicate to the individual with the blood cancer? And I think the whole, the key point is, is that this is a long-term strategy for the individual. As a patient, you need to be thinking about how am I going to manage this, not just in the next month, but over the next year, because the virus is not going to disappear. Uh, it is going to affect a large proportion of the population over the next year. Uh, and so it's likely that every person will come uh, in contact with it. So the strategy has to be one of how do we manage all of that during the high risk period over the next few months, but also long term. So I think that's the thing is, is that you can't put into strategies that are just going to last for a month. It's got to be a strategy that's going to be longer term. And that's really over the year. So the practicalities, therefore, are that um, each patient has to consider their own individual scenario. So patients with an altered immune system are those that are at risk. So that means that patients who have very low grade blood conditions like monoclonal gammopathies or perhaps low grade myeloproliferative diseases or myelodysplasia or um, uh, such things as very early stage chronic lymphocytic leukemia, those that are just under observation that have never had treatment um, and that are simply being observed by their doctor are at a relatively low risk. So yes, they've got blood abnormalities, but their immune system generally is functionally intact. So we would say to those patients that your risk is relatively low. Um, you need to take standard precautions, but you need to speak to your doctor about how much you can do, but re it's rarely anything more than what is being done by, the, by most people in our community. So it's then the next other end of the spectrum, which is who are the high risk patients who are at risk of one, picking up the disease and secondly, having a, a, a worse clinical outcome. So the first thing is, is that independent of your immune system, you'll be exposed to it. And so everyone is really at the same risk of, of picking it up. Um, it's how it affects the individual. And so most people, um, we'll just get a, a cold-like symptoms. The most common symptoms are fever, 
uh, and um, feeling like you have an upper respiratory infection clogged up. But if it, it can go to the chest and shortness of breath uh, and cough are the most common symptoms that we start to worry about. In short, if it's a head cold, we have little to worry about. Once it starts moving to the chest, it can be an issue. So patients who are immune suppressed are more likely to get a, a worsened uh, um, clinical uh, pat picture. And who are those patients? So first of all, I think it's important to look at what is the immune system. So the immune system, there's having low white cells like neutrophils, which, are, which fight predominantly bacterial infections. They're not as critical at fighting viral infections. So if patients are neutropenic, that is one factor, but it's not the major factor. There's the antibody production of our immune system, and the antibodies are produced by B cells. So people who have active lymphoma, myeloma, chronic leukemias that affect the B cells, generally can have suppressed antibody production, and they are at substantial risk. And it's a question of how severe is, is that uh, level of suppression. So the, um, the major issue is if, if there is active suppression happening by ongoing treatment. So people who are getting chemotherapy or antibody-based treatments or people who, for example, have had a... Um, other immune suppression, they have rheumatoid arthritis or other sorts of disorders, um, they're the patients um, where they might be getting immune suppressive treatments that are at highest risk. So if patients have had um, uh, recent chemotherapy, recent antibody treatment that's suppressing their B cells, uh, they are, and treatments such as bone marrow transplants, particularly bone marrow transplants from somebody else, an allogeneic transplant, but also autologous transplant within the last six to 12 months. They are the patients that need to be particularly wary. Um, the the um, sorts of treatments that have may have additional impact or other are patients who are receiving drugs that do suppress the clone, um, like drugs like um, ibrutinib, um, uh, venetoclax that can suppress B cell production for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, ruxolitinib for myeloproliferative diseases that can also be immune suppressive. So patients who are getting chronic drugs, patients with chronic myeloid leukemia who are getting, um, um, who are getting uh, Gleevec or similar sorts of drugs for chronic myeloid leukemia are not as high risk but need to be aware. So you need to speak to your doctor but the, the short term, the, the, the take home message is if you're actively getting treatment, if you're getting, if your immune system is actively being suppressed, you are the patients that are at highest risk. Um, and the, uh, the next group of patients who've had treatment in the last year. Um, and that really does need to be individualized. The, the key people that, uh, that, uh, at the highest risk are those who've had uh, bone marrow transplants from, from somebody else, and they need to speak to their doctor. What about individual diseases? Well, I think that we know that from, from uh, our uh, information about the flu uh, and, and the complications with flu, patients with multiple myeloma are at highest risk, and it's those patients that are getting active treatment now. Patients who have low grade or smouldering myeloma who've not had treatment are at lesser risk and patients who've had treatment and had their transplant more than uh, a year ago are at less risk. You need to speak to your doctor but the myeloma group of patients are those that we monitor most closely. Um, bearing, uh, adding on top of that, what are the other things that we need to be concerned about? Well, I think age. We all know that age greater than 65 puts people at high risk. So young people are more likely to be able to fight it off. Uh, people who, are, who have other uh, um, comorbidities, as we call it, heart disease, lung disease, etc. So hopefully that has given you um, a, a good perspective overall. Um, I think that general comments I would make are you're about to start therapy, um, whether there is a need to delay your treatment. Again, it's got to be taken into the context of what's happening over the next year, because 
this is going to be with us for quite a few months. So options such as not having treatment at all is really not practical. The second is that there may be periods where treatment is delayed or stopped for a period of time. You need to discuss that with your doctor. Things like blood products, blood product shortages will occur. Uh, and so there will be, for patients who have things like myelodysplasia or uh, leukemias that are needing blood product products reg regularly, that will need to be modified. And we're already talking about how we might um, how we might uh, reduce the, the needs for blood products. Um, and um, I think that's um, all I wanted to say, and perhaps I can take some questions. So um, I've just got a couple of other questions, which is what about patients who've had a stem cell transplant and immunosuppression and steroids? Again, as I've mentioned, stem cell transplants are um, uh, a particular risk. Steroids, it depends on the dose, but even the smallest dose in an elderly person is, puts people at risk. Second question is about drugs and their availability. We just don't know. Most drugs are being produced in Europe, uh, South America, and there will be transport issues. I think one needs to be prudent and try and stock up on drugs uh, for at least a month's worth and speak to your doctor. But as a physician, I'm not hearing too much myself. So hopefully that's been valuable for you and um, if everybody is um, if if, um, uh, if people have enjoyed this please let us know and we'll try and do it again and update you in uh, in a week or so thanks very much